All right, welcome back. Uh, we are wrapping up the Rachel's book. The last two weeks of the course, we're going to be moving on to a slightly different topic. Uh, we've been covering meta ethics, right? Um, ethical theory, what is the right ethical theory? Um, we're going to move on to the issue of distributive justice uh, in the last two weeks. But I think um, it's important to cover the concluding chapter of Rachel's book because having surveyed all these different, you know, the most prominent ethical theories and finding you know, good and bad things about each and not having yet landed on which is the best theory. You know, maybe you have some ideas of your own of which ones you prefer. Um, there, for some people, there's a temptation to throw up your hands and be like, this isn't a serious sort of like uh, academic pursuit. There's no right answer. There can never be a right answer. Um, and so some of uh, what Rachel says in this concluding chapter is to say, now, hold on, we have made progress and we sort of have at least a sketch of what, you know, the right moral theory, when we discover it, um, should do, right? We have some what we call desiderata, some things we want out of the best ethical theory. And Rachel's even sketches what he thinks it might look like. Um, so let's get into that. It's a relatively short, uh, short lecture, right? But it's nice to put a bow on the whole, on the whole book. So it's titled, What Would a Satisfactory Moral Theory Be Like, right? So even if we don't have it yet, um, what are the constraints on what it is? So, as I said, we've surveyed some of the most influential moral theories. All of them have some appeal. All of them have some problems. Uh, we haven't said, and, right, utilitarianism seems like the winner, right? We haven't done anything like that. Um, certainly, I would say, you know, these days, the most popular are probably utilitarianism and deontology with virtue ethics maybe a close third. Um, other ones like, uh, you know, divine command theory aren't such active areas of study now, but things always change, right? So it's possible that could uh, return. But yeah, we haven't picked one yet. So, you know, some people maybe uh, feel like maybe we should give up. And Rachel's and I want to encourage you, no, we should not give up, right? Um, every department in the university, in every university, is working on unsolved problems, right? We all have them, that's why we exist. Um, so, you know, we've, we have learned some things. Uh, so what have we learned, right? What could we say about moral theory? Well, I think we have landed on a few elements that uh, for the most part, we can agree the, the, the ultimate moral theory should have. So I think one important point uh, Rachel's brings it up, is a modest conception of human beings. Now, I think people of a religious bent may disagree with this, right? And that's fine. Um, but things like natural law theory, right, of Aristotle, which sort of posits that humans are um, the ultimate end of everything, of all existence, uh, it's hard to hold that view these days, right? Modern science has progressed to a point uh, that our best evidence points to a pretty modest place for humanity in the overall scheme of the universe, right? We've got the Big Bang happened, you know, the universe began 13.8 million years ago, four and a half million, sorry, not million, a <laughs> billion. Um, the Earth formed 4.5 billion years ago, uh, and then humans appeared less than 100,000 years ago. So in the cosmic time scale, we're very recent. Um, we're one among many, many other species, uh, you know, the fact that we're still around is uh, the product of evolution and a, and a fair bit of luck. Uh, things could have easily gone differently and no human would have ever existed, but the universe would have trucked along uh, just as easily, right? Um, so moral theories, you know, like natural law theory that place humans at the center of the moral universe, you know, again, they, they, they are consistent with a religious worldview. And so if, if, if you are persistent, if you want to pursue a religious moral theory, then that could be okay for you. But uh, if you are on board with sort of our best scientific theories of the moment, um, it seems unlikely that humans are gonna hold a special place in, in the moral universe. Um, we certainly are smarter than other species. Uh, we're better able to reason about morality, um, but that doesn't mean that we're the only beings worthy of moral consideration. So, and even if you are a religious person and thinks that humans are important. The point Rachel's is trying to make here is uh, 
we probably have to include other beings as worthy of our moral consideration. And I think even many religious people can accept that. Dogs and cats and uh, animals can be important to us, and we can say it's wrong to kick a pup. Um, not such a controversial claim, right? We, humans, Rachel wants to say that humans can't be just the center of morality and the only thing that's worthy of moral consideration. Uh, second is the relationships between relationship between ethics and reason. So a moral truth, right? If there's any sort of, you know, moral judgments that you believe in, murder is wrong or whatever, uh, those are reasons to do or not do something, right? The wrongness of murder is a reason not to do it, right? The rightness of helping someone in need is a reason to do that, right? Um, now, a lot of what we do uh, is governed by instinct, right? Um, but moral action is special in that it requires rationality, it requires reasons, right? If you just sort of automatically do something, you don't necessarily, or instinctually do something, you don't necessarily deserve moral praise or blame for that. Um, you are praised or blamed for rational choices, right? And it's part of the nature of reasons that they are universal. So if they apply on one occasion, they apply on all similar occasions, right? So if murder, if, um, you know, if one murder, you know, obviously different murders can be in different circumstances, right? So one act of killing can be right and one another act of killing can be wrong, right? Killing a serial killer, you know, to save people can be right and killing an innocent child will be wrong. But we want to say that every killing of an innocent child is going to be wrong. Circumstances are similar, right? They always apply. That makes them reasons. Um, for example, right, we've seen, you know, we now have an explanation. If you weren't sure how to justify why racism was wrong and you just assume, well, of course it's wrong. Uh, yeah, there are reasons why racism is wrong. Um, and it has to do with the nature of reasons and morality. Uh, racism involves treating groups of people differently without a good reason, right? We, again, we can treat people differently. You cannot allow me on the football team. There's good reasons for that. I'm not good at football and, and so on, right? But Treating people differently on the basis of race is not a good reason. So um, the very nature of morality demands impartiality, right? Everyone's interests should count equally unless we have a good reason to treat them differently. Uh, another important thing that our, our you know, ultimate moral theory should preserve is the idea of treating people as they deserve, right? And this is something that utilitarianism doesn't really get and deontology does. Um, so sometimes there are good reasons to treat people differently. And when such a reason exists, we can say that that person deserves better or worse treatment. This is what punishment is all about for uh, people who break the law or harm others, right? Um, and it's also what, you know, if someone is particularly kind or generous, then we feel that they ought to be treated with kindness and generosity. When someone is mean, we don't feel the obligation to treat them any better. So, um, we can treat different people differently, and when we do, it's because they deserve it, right? Um, justifies this difference in treatment, but right? we just said you need a good reason to treat people differently. Um, and the assumption here is that each person is a responsible agent with free will that makes choices that reflect their values, right? So if somebody is mean and unkind, that indicates that they don't value kindness, which means we have no obligation to treat them with kindness. They don't care about kindness. Uh, so, the correct moral theory should capture some of that too, right? So that's a kind of a Kantian element that utilitarianism doesn't capture, but the everyone counts equally is kind of a utilitarian element, right? That should be incorporated as well. How you're going to reconcile these in a single theory is yet to be seen, right? But they both seem like important elements that we want to keep. Another important element that we'd want to keep in our final moral theory is a variety of motives, right? So, um, <clears throat> On, sometimes we want to treat everyone equally, but not always, right? We want some some room to treat, you know, our children and our families better than we treat other people, right? Um, we need to have a variety of motives and a variety of, of duties in different contexts, right? We should have greater duties to people with whom we have close relationships, our friends, our lovers, our parents, our children. Um, and we also want to leave room for people with very specific motives to pursue a different sort of lifestyle, right? So, um, you know, Beethoven spent a lot of time composing, 
He may have even neglected his, you know, his loved ones a bit. He certainly, you know, he could have spent all that time composing his symphonies out there helping the poor. He, for all we know, maybe he would have generated more happiness that way, right? Although his songs have also produced a lot of happiness. Um, but given his artistic talent, right, and what it means to the world, we agree that Beethoven has different motives and he has a different path and it's morally okay for him to do. So Rachel's proposes to reconcile these various desiderata um, under what he calls a multiple strategies utilitarianism. Uh, so it's at base, it's a fundamentally utilitarian approach, right? Um, that he thinks he can, can be reconciled if you kind of tweak utilitarianism a bit. Right? So again, all these principles that seem to be in conflict, impartiality, right, getting what you deserve, a diversity of motives, um, he thinks we can bring them all together under a utilitarian umbrella. So uh, it's a, maybe a sort of you rule utilitarianism, right? you rule utilitarianism where we say, look, on the whole, the world will be better off if we treat people but with certain exceptions, right? So it's gonna be better overall for society if children get special treatment from their mothers, if murderers get worse treatment than non-murderers, if Beethoven is allowed to spend his time composing instead of working in a soup kitchen. Um, so it's a sort of rule utilitarian approach that instead of like action by action, we ask, oh, should I pull the, the lever in the trolley problem and kill my mom to say four, right? Instead we say at a more general level, Will it be best for everyone if people can, their mothers, right, as strangers, right? Um, and he thinks that'll be, right, that, that will make the world better off and that can be a broadly utilitarian approach. Uh, now that doesn't mean that our, the reason we treat our children special is because we're doing utilitarian calculus, right? So there's a difference between utilitarianism or the, his version of utilitarianism being the correct moral theory and whether or not individual humans um, know that it's the correct moral theory or even use it to guide their actions, right? He says, that's fine, right? Whatever your motivations are, those might be just evolved kind of things, right? Where, yeah, every creature uh, wants to protect its children, but utilitarianism can say why that's good, right? So, you know, each of us have might, might have our own best plan for our life that's not necessarily motivated by utilitarianism, um, but allowing people to do that does create overall a better world with more so we can allow beethoven to concentrate on composition because he loves music not because he's thinking about utilitarianism but that's going to create more pleasure overall so it'll be fine for utilitarian now one interesting thing right so again if if what justifies all these different aspects is that they as a general rule if we do that it'll make the world better off that does mean that um right the moral community that we are concerned with is pretty large actually right it's the whole world um that's tough for humans to do we haven't right we, we're still sort of tribal and there's just so many people so many billions of people that it's hard to like care about all of them right um but he argues that's something that we need to work on improving right um the world, the economy has advanced to a level where the things you do now can affect people. And so you need to expand uh, your moral horizons a bit. Um, and so that part can be revisionary and it can be a little bit of a, a bite the bullet strategy. Be like, it may seem unintuitive that you have to be thinking about, you know, the whole world, um, but just get used to it, right? That's the world we live in now. So if, right, we agree with Rachel's that the best theory is kind of a broadly utilitarian approach, have we given up, have we given up on justice and fairness? Remember that was an issue for utilitarianism, right? All the, um, you know, where they unjustly imprisoned the guy to prevent the riot situation. It seemed like uh, utilitarianism was incompatible with many of our intuitions about justice and fairness, right? Um, he's tried to work, deserve, right? getting what you deserve into the outlet, right? So there's a reason not to uh, not to imprison an innocent person and instead to imprison guilty people, right? One of the things we want to preserve is people get what they deserve. 
Now, I think he says, if that's the general rule, right? Remember, we had a rule utilitarian approach that seemed to save our intuitions about general. And it sounds like Mitt Rachels is going for a kind of rule utilitarianism. He doesn't address the problems that he pointed out for rule utilitarianism, you know, back. Uh, but if you can make it work, then yeah, I guess broadly you could preserve our intuitions about justice, about people getting what they deserve. If we say, well, you know, if everyone follows those rules, then overall creating more equality. Um, so anyways, that's a sort of sketch, right? Just to leave on, 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 on an optimistic note to say, hey, there's people are still working on this and it's an open area of inquiry and um, there's progress to be made and, and maybe something like this could work, right? Uh, so <clears throat> relatively short, so I'm interested to hear what you think in the, you know, in the discussion comments. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to reading your essay drafts and uh, we'll see you next week when we sort of switch uh, our focus a bit in and focus on distributive justice.